good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Bruce Brown. I work at the University of Brighton. And I think the first thing I have to do is to extend a very warm welcome to all of you on a windy Brighton evening. And this evening's event is presented within the Brighton Fringe programme. And it's part of another programme that has been funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And this funding was won by the Royal Holloway University of London in partnership with the University of Brighton's College of Arts and Humanities. And I'd particularly like to thank at this point my colleagues Professor Alan Tomlinson and Helen Baker for organising this event this evening. So, tonight, uh, Robert McFarlane will be in conversation with the BBC's Andrew Tomlinson. And their discussion will, I hope, focus on Robert McFarlane's latest book, Landmarks, as well as his earlier book, The Old Ways. And of landmarks, um, Robert has said, I believe, what we need is a terra britannica, a gathering of terms for the land and its weathers, terms used by crofters, fishermen, farmers, sailors, scientists, miners, climbers, soldiers, shepherds, poets, walkers, and unrecorded others. So this glorious compendium of words includes, for example, amyl, which is a thin film of ice on leaves, purr, which is a light breath of wind, glassil, a shiny wet pebble, and something I remember from my Scottish youth, rory bumblers, which are fast-moving clouds. And Robert is a fellow of Emmanuel College in Cambridge, where he lectures in the Faculty of Literature. He chaired the Man Booker Prize for Fiction in 2013, and his first publication, Mountains of the Mind, won the Guardian First Book Award in 2003. His own doctorate was rooted in 19th century British literature, but the books that have made him, in the words of John Burnside, our finest nature writer, have cultivated a style of transcending that, often the, that transcends the often narrow and specialised conventions of academic writing. He blends the poetic and the scientific, the geographic and the cultural historical, the literary and the experiential. His work is featured on television, and radio, including BBC Two's documentary, The Living Mountain, in February this year, and Radio 4's Book of the Week, just a few weeks ago. Just yesterday, and I think you might have travelled this morning, yes. you remember, yes. <laughs> yes. Just yesterday, Robert received the Premio Itas Award in Italy. It is the oldest mountain literature award in the world, being founded in 1971 by Itas in Trento, North Italy. And Trento is in the Dolomites, and is the birthplace of International Mountain Film Festival. Andrew Tomlinson studied law at the University of Leeds and began at the BBC in the 1990s. He worked in radio and television as a reporter and correspondent, specialising in health issues before moving into production. As the editor of Current Affairs output at BBC Birmingham, he was responsible for a portfolio of in-house programmes as well as commissioning many independently made factual productions for the BBC. A three-time winner of the Royal, Soci the Royal Television Society Awards, Andrew has also edited the BBC's hugely popular Country File, as well as the religion and ethics programme uh, magazine the, he the Heaven and Earth Show. Andrew is currently running key aspects of the two BBC's two of the BBC's major campaigns to make, to make it digital tour and get creatives visual arts initiatives around the BBC One series, The Big Painting Challenge. And among his other BBC learning credits, Andrew was also responsible for formulating the BBC's digital literacy strategy and delivering it via a series of multi-platform projects ranging from Safer Internet Day to the BBC Current Affairs show, Free Speech. Now, with these introductions done, May I ask you to extend a very, very warm welcome to Robert McFarlane and Andrew Tomlinson for what I'm sure <laughs> will be an engaging evening. Thank you. Well, first of all, can I say thank you very much for joining us in this amazing place. I'm, I'm loving the wallpaper. Uh, <laughs> my home city of Manchester has got some pretty ornate buildings, but nothing quite like this. Um, this evening, it's, this is the perfect place because this evening is for celebrating and discussing the work of, of this man, Robert McFarlane, uh, and particularly his latest book, Landmarks. Um, my background is as a programme maker, and, and it's taken me from news to current affairs to education by the way of religion and ethics, but most memorable for me is my time at Countryfile, 
at the, what the BBC in its typical fashion calls the Rural Affairs Unit. <laughs> As a programme, we'll talk about that language in a moment, I'm sure. <laughs> As a programme maker working to really tight deadlines, it's often tempting to accept and broadcast the received wisdom on all sorts of issues. However hard you try to get to the core truth, sometimes time beats you and you accept essentially what you're told. Uh, there are many examples of that during my time on Country File, uh, but one that really sticks with me um, is the idea of there are no truly wild places left in Britain. If one work challenged that idea and changed my approach to my job at the time it was Robert's book, The Wild Places. The idea that there's no wilderness left is beautifully deconstructed in a series of journeys and it made me think a bit harder about precision in what I'm doing for a living and that's no bad thing. So I'm a really big fan, Robert, and I'm delighted to be here to talk, talk to you about your latest book, Landmarks. And there's been a lot said from an academic perspective. I hope perhaps we can see it from a few other perspectives as well this evening, um, but in classic BBC fashion, I promise I won't dumb down. <laughs> so I think the best way to get started is to uh, hear an extract from the book, um, so it's over to you. All right, good evening everybody. Some of you I know from today, and thank you very much for coming back to hear a little more from me. Uh, some of you uh, I'm fresh to this evening, thank you so much for coming along. Uh, to this this room of trompe loy and super nature and para nature and it is it's just the most fabulous artifice that we are inhabiting here and thank you too for walking along under these rory bumblers that are <laughs> crashing along your fabulous south coast this evening so I I've haven't slept in about 48 hours but a walk along that seafront uh, left my brain completely rerouted uh, all around, so I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I think, am I keeping the mic, is the mic sort of moving in and out? All right, okay. So some of you will know a little about this book, some of you will know a little about me, some of you will know nothing at all about either, and I just wanted to begin by moving back to 2007, which is roughly where Landmarks has its origin, though all books can be followed back and back as a series of roots in both senses. But in 2007, I was on the Outer Hebrides, uh, on the Isle of Lewis, where I have a lot of friends, a, a landscape I've written a lot about, and a landscape that at first glance can seem to be repetitive to the point of self-similarity, more, more, and more, more, as they say up there. Um, uh, but that language, or that landscape of ostensible repetition has bred and created a language of astonishing intricacy, subtlety, and discrimination. And one of the keepers of that language is a friend of mine called Finley MacLeod. If you've read The Old Ways, you'll have met Finley MacLeod there. And he returns early on in Landmarks. And this is uh, what he handed me in 2007, or a little of it. So I've just turned up on the moor, and we're, at, we're out in Finley's... Uh, Croft, effectively, though that, that term means a, a, a well-built house these days, uh, on the west coast with the Atlantic crashing in. That evening after we'd eaten, we sat in Finley's living room and he played me a crackly recording of Gaelic psalm singing made on the skerry of Suleskir in the early 1950s. Then he passed me a stapled sheaf of paper. I've been working on this recently, he said, and I thought it might interest you. You need to imagine everything Finley says in this beautiful, he's a bilingual Gaelic English speaker and has that lovely kind of shh to everything he says. It's absolutely beautiful if you've heard English spoken with a Gaelic accent. It did. The document was a word list entitled Some Lewis Moorland Terms, a Pete Glossary. And together with his friends, Anne Campbell, Katrina Campbell and Donald Morrison, Finley explained he'd been carrying out a survey of the language used in three Lewisian townships, Shawbost, Braga, and Shadder, to denote aspects of the moor. The peat glossary ran to several pages and more than 120 terms, and as that modest sum in its title acknowledged, it was incomplete. There's so much more to be added to it, Anne told me later. It represents only three villages worth of words. I have a friend from South Uist who said her grandmother would add dozens to it. Every village in the upper islands would have its different phrases to contribute. I sat and read the glossary that evening by the fire in Finley's house, fascinated and moved. Many of the terms it contains are notable for their compressive precision. 
Bua is a green bow-shaped area of moor grass or moss formed by the winding of a stream. Rionach Moim means the shadows cast on the moorland by clouds moving across the sky on a bright and windy day. Etch refers to the practice of placing quartz stones in moorland streams so that they would sparkle in moonlight and thereby attract salmon to them in the late summer and autumn. That's a lot to pack down into three letters. Um, and not long after I got back from Lewis that year, a revelation occurred in the public domain that some of you will know a little about, but which turned out to be much more ripply than its tiny original impact might have implied. And that was that a new edition of the Oxford Junior Dictionary was published. And a sharp-eyed reader noticed that there had been a set of omissions from the new edition of the dictionary, which is aimed at seven to nine-year-olds. And among those words omitted were many concerning nature. Under pressure, Oxford University Press revealed a list of the entries it no longer felt to be relevant to a modern day childhood. The deletions formed an almost perfect A to Z, and they included acorn, adder, ash, beech, bluebell, buttercup, catkin, conker, cowslip, signet, dandelion, heather, heron, kingfisher, lark, newt, otter, pasture, and willow. The words introduced to the new edition to take their places included attachment, block graph, blog, broadband, bullet point, celebrity, chat room, committee, cut and paste, MP3 player, and voicemail. <laughs> For Blackberry, read Blackberry. <laughs> when Vanita Gupta, then head of children's dictionaries at OUP, was asked why the decision had been taken to delete those nature words as they came to be known, she explained that the dictionary needed to reflect the consensus experience of modern day childhood. When you look back at older versions of dictionaries, there were lots of examples of flowers, for instance, she said. That was because many children lived in semi-rural environments and saw the seasons. Nowadays, the environment has changed. Well, there's a realism to her response, but also an alarming acceptance of the idea that children might no longer see the seasons, or that the rural environment, whatever that word connotes, might be so unproblematically disposable from our everyday lives. And it was really the collision between those two encounters with forms of naming and language as a medium of connection, knowledge, or alienation and disconnection, the Lewis Peet glossary, which is a prose poem, effectively in list form, and then the culling of the words from the Oxford Dictionary that began the project of recovery, of salvage, a kind of crowdsourced mega glossary of landscape language that has eventually found the form of landmarks, which contains nine glossaries organized by terrain type, nine chapters about writers who have used landscape language with particular precision and illumination, and then a blank glossary at the end, which is there to contain the words that the reader might wish to add to that book. And there is, there is in the paperback edition going to be another glossary, but we may come on to that. So I wanted to gather these words wherever I found them in many dialects and languages and re-release them in some way back into the imagination, if not quite into the mouths. So that's how this book began. Thank you. Uh, you say in the first few pages that it's a book about um, the power of language to shape our sense of place, and that seems like a perfect example. It, it struck me that it, it's about the power of language to do much more than that as well, in, uh, actually to, to stop the desecration of a landscape or to allow individuals to express themselves in a way that they wouldn't otherwise do, in the case of Nan Shepherd, for example, or J.A. Baker. Um, would you agree with that? Do you think the power of language is, is, is there, is more than that? Well, um, yes, in its finest forms. I mean, language is, uh, is everything. It's, it's, the, it's the medium we swim in, and it can be turned to any use that you want, the uses of enchantment as, uh, or the uses of desecration, depending on the, use, uh, depending on the intent. Uh, but I did become fascinated by the possibilities of expressions of intimacy, care, love, good relations with places that might seem, at first glance, hard to come to know, hard to represent, lacking a language with which to describe them. And so when places go undescribed, they typically become much harder to protect, particularly in the context of 
cost benefits analysis and uh, use value frameworks with which we typically approach and evaluate pretty much everything. And, and you say, I think, quite rightly, that there, if there aren't words to describe something, then it's impossible or, or hard to love them. Yes, I, yes, I do see that. I'm, I'm not a... I'm not a linguist, I'm not a Warfian, I don't believe that our brains are cognitively restructured by the languages we speak, but I do believe that language can powerfully refocus the optics through which we see. Astonishing books can change the ways we engage with our places and the people that inhabit them. And I also feel that forms of scintillation, brightening and refocusing of attention can be carried out by language, and an example of that is this wonderful Sussex word, smuse, S-M-E-U-S-E. -E. Sussex word, hey, brilliant, I'm in situ. I think I remember what that one is. Yeah, go on then. That is a, a small gap in a hedge for a small animal to get through. Yes, that a small animal is made by regular passage back Nearly. and forth. It's basically like a commuter tunnel for a badger or a rabbit or a hare, and until I knew this word, I barely noticed them, and now, Every hedgerow is riddled with smooses. smooses everywhere. Yeah. yeah. I've taken advice on the pronunciation of smooze, incidentally, from the BBC dialect department, but oh, I'm right. very happy to be gainsaid by in this place. Yeah, okay. I wouldn't take too much notice of that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting that you draw, or, or I drew parallels, I'm not sure that you necessarily did, but, but they're there by implication, between uh, hugely disparate landscapes. So, for example, uh, you, you talk about the moors of the Outer Hebrides, but also um, the, the deserts and scrublands of Central America. And, and the, 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 the similarity is that the closer you look, the more you see that there is a huge amount of variety in a landscape that just looks very... like a void, I think, is the word that you use. Uh, presumably, you were aware that, that, that there is a, 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 a parallel between these kind of seemingly disparate landscapes in that sense. Yeah, I became fascinated by landscapes that we discriminate against because they seem to lack their own forms of internal variety, at least at the scale at which we view them. And so we've typically exercised uh, discriminations against flat, flat landscapes. So Moors, heaths have suffered drastically in the 20th century, um, tundra, plateau. These are all places that are flat and they're quite hard to see into. They lack the charisma of mountains. And so, yeah, I became fascinated by the ways in which languages sprung up actually to account for their intricacies but um, but the ways in which those languages often were not available for for common use they were language of of the commons really because we share a knowledge don't we of the outer hebrides um, i was there a few years ago for a large portion of the december of that year <laughs> <laughs> absolutely freezing um and uh, but th the thing that i was told repeatedly by by the locals there was that this landscape is more interesting than you think. Take a close look at the Macca. There's a lot going on there. And they would describe to me how um, seaweed would be brought in to fertilize the Macca, and therefore, you know, some areas would grow better than others. And I had a tour of the island. And by the end of it, what looked like a fairly bland landscape had a new, an entirely new dimension. And presumably, you, you, you felt something similar as well. Yes, well, I mean, I think any, many people here will know that sense of a not being able to read a landscape and then learning your way into it and suddenly it, revelations spring up at every stride and the book is filled with notices, Clo Nan Shepherd in the Cairngorms, John Muir in the Sierra Nevada, J.A. Baker in unloved and apparently unlovely Essex, uh, finding it as wild as, as the Karakoram or the, or the Pamirs because he's seeing through the eyes of a falcon or a hawk and everything is sprung into strangeness by that. So I've long been interested by people who see landscapes through certain uh, lenses, and that includes people who work landscapes. And this, this book is full of uh, the language of labor, and indeed the language of discomfort as a result, because a lot of landscapes are tough places to be in, and, and tougher places to work uh, consistently. Yeah, and some of the descriptions you have of, of Nan Shepherd in the Cairngorms on a winter's day, the way she describes that experience is you can almost feel a cold biting in your face, can't you? Yes, I mean, that mountains are tough places, the, the downs are tough places, and um, I, 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 I didn't want this language, as I kind of gathered it, to, to be a, a language of beatitude and illumination only. It needed to record uh, many of the experiences, the weathers, the feeling of being weathered 
by the places through which we, we move. We, we, we're stripped back by them, we're left raw by them sometimes, but we're also shaped and eroded and formed by them. So I wanted, I mean, the language came as it came. I, I sent out many, many letters. I spent a long time in glossaries on the web and, uh, and in archives and in libraries, and I talked and talked and traveled and traveled, and, and, and slowly it was clear there was a language for our places that w wasn't really around and amazing things have happened since putting it back out there um, which we, we, we might come on to and there's clearly a real relish for, um, for the possibility of speaking with precision and excitement and relish and love about particularities of landscape. You, you talk um, a lot about precision um, and the difference between one of the things that you spell out, and which I found really interesting, is the difference between precision uh, and rigor. Um, would you mind explaining that uh, that again and just elaborating a little bit? I am an academic in my day job, so rigor is part of what's expected. But it does, in my mind, quite often get followed by the word mor mortis, and um, <laughs> and I find something perhaps a little. Uh, um, uh, fixed about about rigor, um, precision. I imagine as a as a form of pin sharp illumination. And when I am reading the work of certain writers, uh, seeing the work of certain artists, or indeed encountering certain particular words, it feels as though a sharpening is happening. Uh, but when I encounter rigor, it feels as though a setting is happening. And, and you also talk. You also talk about um, metaphor enhancing precision, which I thought was really interesting because a lot of people would think the opposite, wouldn't they? If you start using metaphor, then you're losing precision almost automatically. And uh, I can't remember which one of the one of the authors it is, but one of them uses, um, I think it's Baker. One of them uses something like 130 metaphors in the first six pages of his book. And that's something that you say adds precision to what he's saying. Uh, I thought that's really interesting. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Well, I don't know how many of you know J.A. Baker's book, The Peregrine. If you've read it, you won't have forgotten it. But I mean, this, this, it is this, it's a prose poem, uh, but the, it is metaphorically drastic. So there's one moment where he refers to a, a, a cock blackbird as a small, mad Puritan with an upturned banana for a moustache. And you read that and you think, preposterous! And then you read it again and you think, brilliant. And then he, he talks about a wood pigeon that's been felled on a field, on a ploughed field by a peregrine. And he talks about it being purple and grey as broccoli in the field. And, and for some reason, these, to me at least, the, these leap into the mind's eye and in, inhabit it. Uh, even though they seem ridiculous baroque ornamentations of the natural world. And so I became interested in the ways in which, as we seem to be uh, adding to, uh, to nature's um, uh, uh, essences. In fact, that might be the best job we can do in terms of, of seeing aspects of it because we are, uh, language is, is, what, is what mediates that engagement. And Baker himself obsessively counted his own metaphors and similes. Yeah, he sat in his room with his proofs in Essex in 1966 and he counted every metaphor and every simile on every page of his book and tallied them up. And the numbers are incredible. And, this, and what it adds up to is a form of dynamism. If you've read that book, it is one of the wildest language experiences that I've ever had. And part of that is this kinesis and release of this incredible metaphoric language. You see that falcon uh, in its full dramatic form because the language is so artificial rather than despite it. So it doesn't always work. Bad writing is bad writing. Baker pulls it off. Yeah, speaking of seeing that falcon, it's falcon. It's probably time now to hear. All right, I've really teed, I really teed that. myself up. Yeah, now. yeah. Um, <laughs> well done. Uh, but no, I will. I will just read a, 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 a little from the. We, there are going to be three readings. The last of which will be very short. Um, the, this one uh, just a li uh, not as long as the first, but it's about seeing a peregrine, and it's about trying to see what I saw, if that makes sense. And I'm going to read it, and you'll hear there are three versions of the same site. That's not a mistake on the editor's part. Um, it is an attempt to, s to, to, to 
account for this encounter. I live in South Cambridge in a suburb. It's not where peregrines typically knock around. As it happens, there's a steep-sided chalk pit where mountaineering practice was carried out in Cambridgeshire in the early 20th century because there aren't many other places you can do it in Cambridgeshire. And, um, and peregrines have come and nested there. And indeed, they now yet nest on the university library. Have you got peregrines in Brighton? Got them on the, s on the cliffs or in the... The w where are they? Oh, really? Okay. Oh, great. They're coming. They're on Norwich Cathedral. I have this thesis that they prefer Roman Catholic architecture to, <laughs> um, but it keeps being disproved by the birds. So, um, um, but they are on the Catholic Church in Cambridge as well. So, um, but I, uh, the day I went to see Baker's archive, was also the day when I saw a peregrine in. Cambridgeshire for the very first time, and this is an attempt to account for that encounter in all its coincidence and uh, kinesis. What did I see that morning? Hot winter sun on the face's brink, felt as red but seen as gold, air still, blue, tremors at the edge of vision, quick dark curve and slow straight line over green old in the eye, intersection, shrapnel of down, Grey drop to crop, flail and clatter, four chops and the black star away with quick wing flicks. Let me tell that again, clearer now, if clearer is right. What did I see that morning? A green field dropping citywards, the narrow track at the bronze woods border, the sun low but strong in the cold, then odd forms glimpsed in the eyes selvage. The straight line, grey, the flight path of a wood pigeon passing over the field, the fast curve, dark, the kill path of a peregrine cutting south from the height of the beech tops. The pigeon is half struck but not clutch, chest feathers blossom. It falls to the low cover of the crop and flails for safety to a hedge. The falcon rises to strike down again, misses, rises, misses again. Two more rises and two more misses. The pigeon makes the hedge, and as I rush the wood edge to close the gap, the falcon, tired, lifts and turns and flies off east and fast over the summits of the hilltop trees with quick sculling wing flicks. And let me tell it one last time, clearer still, perhaps. What did I see that morning? It was windless. It was late winter. The sky was milky blue and leaves drifted in the path verges, thrown from the trees by a night frost and a gale not long since dropped away. And that afternoon I was due to drive to Essex to see the archive of a man called John Alec Baker, author of The Peregrine, and among the contents of the archive were Baker's binoculars and telescopes, with which he'd spent a decade watching and tracking the falcons that wintered each year in the fields and margins of Essex. And before leaving, I decided to go for a run up to the beech woods that stand on a low hill of chalk a mile or so from my home. A thin path leads to the woods, a path I've walked or run every few days for the last ten years, and thereby come to know its usual creatures, its usual colours, its usual weathers. I reached the fringe of the beech wood where the trees met a big sloping field, where my eye was caught by strange shapes and vectors, the low, slow flight of a pigeon over the dangerous open of the field, and the quick striking curve of a sparrow hawk. No, a peregrine, somehow a peregrine, unmistakably a peregrine now, closing to it from height. The falcon slashed at the pigeon, half hit it, sent up a puff of down. The bird dropped into the rape and panicked towards the cover of the hawthorn hedge. I ran to get closer along the fringe of the wood, but the falcon saw me coming, had known I was an agent in the drama since before it had first struck, and so it lifted and flew off east over the beech tops, black against the blue sky, its crossbow profile, what Baker calls its cloud-biting anchor shape, clear in silhouette as my blood thudded. I'd followed the path to the beech woods a thousand times, literally a thousand times. I'd seen kestrels, sparrowhawks, buzzards, once a tawny owl, twice a red kite, but never a peregrine. And a few hours later, still high from the luck of it, I left for Essex to look through Baker's eyes. I love that phrase, a cloud-biting anchor shape. It's fantastic, isn't it? He's the man. He's the man. <laughs> the characters, that, the, the authors that you, you um, feature in, in landscape, in, 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 in landmarks, um, they, they're a, 
and I say this with respect, a quite a motley crew, aren't they? <laughs> you know, you have um, you have a, a bird spotter who, in some respects, isn't actually very good at bird spotting, but writes beautifully. Um, you have um, a fairly buttoned up Presbyterian woman who spends half her time on the side of a mountain. She 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 went skinny dipping quite a lot and offended. Oh, maybe she's not as buttoned up as I thought. Offended her Presbyterian <laughs> neighbours drastically. So did she? Uh, ah, lived okay. an unconventional life, but she did spend half her life on the side of a mountain. This being Nan Nan Shepherd. So. This being Nan Shepherd. And how how did you choose them? Did you choose them for their writing, or did you also choose them because they are such interesting individuals? Well, you must have found this through Countryfile. Um, the land people who have intense relationships with their landscapes are, at least to me, intensely interesting, and uh, I, I feel the benefit of, of 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 the bite of their knowledge um, hugely. And I, I I love hearing them talk. I love reading them write. And so, in a sense, that they found me uh, through through their writing. And the the book was also filled with children. It, it, it's filled. Um, with uh, uh, friends, and so uh, there are some weirdos in there, uh, for sure, and some marginal people, but in a sense it's these marginal obsessives who have found their way often closest to forms of, uh, of, of, of communication with the landscape. I mean, I don't know, I mean, you've met so many characters through yes. Country File, uh, but they were brought alive by their relationship with their landscapes. Uh, well, they were, and the, and the key to a successful film on well on any program, uh, but Country File in particular, I always thought was that it's not just about the landscape; it's about those individuals and their place in that landscape. And the films that really worked were not the ones that were really based on hardcore h rural journalism, if you want to call it that, but th those based on personality and, and individuals and people who'd spent a long period of their life living in the same part of the world. And I think that's one of the reasons why the the, the self shot material, where the 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 producer director would go out on their own and spend maybe four or five days with an individual in wherever it might be, Orford Ness or or the uh, the Outer Hebrides or wherever it might be, they are the films that work the best for me because you felt that they got under the skin of these people and they understood these individuals, and they're they're a long way removed from from conventional BBC journalism where, you know, you will do a stand-up interview with somebody and, you know, uh, shoot a few pictures to go in between. They're a world away from that and that they're the ones that I loved making and loved commissioning. Yep. 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 <laughs> so, yeah. you know, the, the, joy, the joy of that programme really is that uh, it's an hour long, it's on every week, um, so there's a chance to do so many different things. You know, the, the, the texture of the programme means that you, know, you are talking to individuals and finding out about their lives in the landscape as well as reflecting whatever the latest is in, in terms of, you know, the agricultural news and that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's something um, that the book touches on, perhaps something that we are both interested in, but this relationship between technology and nature, for want of a better word. Uh, I mean, I began with that opposition implicitly of uh, an organic peat language born of long-term labour um, and then the loss of innocent words for nature replaced by simulated, technologized vocabulary. Uh, it's not as easy as that, of course, as an opposition by any means. And um, one of the things I've been interested in is how far technology can actually bring about forms of um, closeness and relationship and care. And I, I quite often find myself saying I'm not anti-technology, I'm anti-technocracy. It's, it's a, f a feeling of the, of the, of the totality and, and reach of, of, of the screen. But the book is a medium as well, and this is, in that sense, a book about media. So um, I wondered how, you know, the, the work you've made is all, all about bringing people into closer relation, but it's broadcast by... It, it, it is, and arguably the, 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 the parts of the country that need that technology the most are the ones that have had it the least, you know, until recently. Um, the, the, the broadband rollout hadn't reached some of these places we've just been talking about, you know, the Outer Hebrides, Cornwall, these sort of places. And people suffered 
a great deal as a result. You know, that ability to to talk to your neighbours and friends using whatever Skype, any of those kind of any of those kind of um, uh, uh, methods, it just wasn't there. Whereas all those people packed together in the cities who could see each other anyway and engage with people, and they tend to be younger anyway, had all of these things. And I think the balance is changing now, and and you know now that broadband is going out to those areas, and this is something we reflected quite a lot. And it seems like a peripheral issue to a lot of people. Well, does it really matter whether that village has got broadband? But it matters a great deal to those people for all sorts of reasons. You know, isolation, business, all those kinds of things. Well, the, the Outer Hebrides, as people here will probably know, has been suffering a problem of depopulation, um, redu reduction in population numbers, and actually it looks as though that has to a degree been slowed, if not halted, by the arrival of broadband, because home working is suddenly a possibility, high-skilled employment can be carried out from the islands, um, and, uh, and, and, and pr proceeded from there, and it's, it's starting to make a difference. And, and I think some of those issues that you talk about... Um, that, that matter a great deal to people in those communities because of technology, uh, because of social media, because of Twitter. People know about these things much more than they did. They don't seem as peripheral as they used to. Uh, you know, when you occasionally saw an article in whatever, the Telegraph, about the f issues being faced by people um, in Cornwall, then you might go, well, okay, that sounds problematic. But now... <laughs> But now, you know, people will talk about these things all the time. That it's just as it's just as prominent as anybody else's issue. I think that's really important. So one of the things that happened after the book was published, uh, the first chapter was published in the Guardian uh, before the book appeared, and suddenly my editor got in touch and said, "Go and check out the website. the The share count is going is just starting to go up and up and up." And we watched it uh, go hit 40,000 uh, direct shares and then 250,000 reads and suddenly these emails and, and, and these recirculation was happening of the, of the first chapter, an essay about, you heard a little of it, about a subtlety of language and it was clearly much less to do with the way the essay was written and much more to do with people's fascination with, with, with this kind of language but of course this circulation was being facilitated by a wired, globalized technology, even though the subject of the essay was about localism and precision. And it was, it was an incredibly exciting time, and communication began to pour in every day from all around the world, again made possible um, by social media. And I then, we then began to ask for words, new words, or lost words, or old words, or made words to be sent in that weren't in the glossaries. And I asked for them to come by postcard, because I quite like getting postcards. Um, but we also asked for them to come by Twitter, because you can fit a word and a definition and an origin pretty much in a, in a tweet. And they came by both versions, in their sackfuls by postcards to where I work, but in their weightless sackfuls by Twitter. And so it has actually, and that's what the, the final glossary of the book is going to be when I republish it, is all of these new words, new old words that have been given to me and they've come from nine-year-olds and 90-year-olds and they have come from miners and farmers and soldiers and shepherds as well as everyday, uh, other kinds of everyday folk. And I'm going to put all of those in, the, in, a, in, a, in a, a sort of final glossary the, of the given words and send those back out and see what happens to them. And people have started making poems of them and uh, an art of them, and it's nothing, I'm just a kind of circulation point, um, and suddenly they're back out, these words, leading these wild, faunal lives, and it's been, it's been brilliant, but it's been made possible by screens, <laughs> in large part. And uh, one of the words that uh, I remember from your book is honey fur, um, which was made up by a child. And can you tell us a little bit about that one? And I'll tell you about one of my words from when I was a kid. <laughs> and I love the, the swapsies that go on. Um, yeah, so I did the last chapter of the book really is about children and the language w and the bodies with which children meet their landscapes and the incredible absence of scale and limit that, they, that young children have when in. So it's about work I was involved with with a group of pre-primary pre school children in Hinchingbrook Country Park in North Cambridgeshire which has got the A14 on one side and a hospital on another and it's just a you know patch of lake and meadow and wood but to the children who were going there every week and being allowed to talk and explore without any kind of adult intervention just supervision it was an astonishing 
universe. And they met it with words, they met it with stories, they met it with drawings, and they met it with their bodies. They would lie down. We all know how children interact with the world in ways we still quite like doing sometimes, but they eat it and they smell it and they cover themselves in it and they roll in it. And uh, these are forms of encounter. But one, they also coined words, because if they didn't have a word, then they made one up and stickle-bricked bits of words together. So th this lovely word, honey fur, was something that a five-year-old came up with for when you, you run your fingers up a, a seed head of grass and you get that little kind of bunch of soft seeds in your fingers. And that was, that was honey fur to her. And so, um, and I've been sent many, many children's coinages since, since then. But yeah, tell, and, and tell and me it, yours. Well, it, it reminded it me and of something that I'd forgotten for decades, which was... Um, and a word that I, I was sure we'd made up as children, and, and I had to go and check it and go back to the dictionary and, and no, it isn't there, so we did make it up. And it's sticky stock. So sticky stock are the burrs that you get covered in when you're running around the North Yorkshire Moors and not really paying much attention. Um, so there was, there's my little contribution, sticky stock. Sticky stock it is. You, with the children's words, they're almost always portmanteaus or um, uh, stickle brick words, so they'll take take two bits and, and, and stick them together and a, you know, a linguist would, um, would, would, would disapprove but it's, it, it's, they're gleaming handfuls of coinage when you, when you meet them um, and uh, I, 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 I love them. Um, so my, I talked briefly about my seven-year-old. I said, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a, a word for the shining curve of water as it runs over a, a stone, in, a rounded stone in the river and instead of telling me to... Sh Shut up. He he said um, he said mm, current bum, and I thought <laughs> that is brilliant. I'm having that, um, which also did put me in mind of the meaning of lif, which many people here will know, where uh, um, uh, John Lloyd and Douglas Adams took English place names, uh, British place names, and then and then assigned them to feelings and experiences that did not have a name but needed one. So. Uh, famously, Aberystwyth is a nostalgic feeling of longing for a thing or a place which is actually far less pleasant than the nostalgic feeling of longing <laughs> for the... Um, and Kimmeridge, not too far from here, is the, uh, the feeling of light wind ruffling your armpit hair as you sunbathe with your hands behind your head on the beach. Um, so, and, and so it goes on. Some of them, I, I have to say, are slightly tainted by a and a 1980s uh, casual misogyny and, and probably should be expunged from any new edition, but the majority of them are magnificent. And language is funny and rude and impious, and it, this, this book is filled with turd stools and ula, meaning the unctuous filth that runs from a dung heap in Shetland, and all stuff you want to call your younger brother, basically. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I wanted all that to be in there as well. So, yeah, sticky stock. Uh, not rude, but... You know, no, not rude enough. Not rude not enough, rude yeah, enough. okay, well, yeah, <laughs> try harder next time, please. Um, I was really interested because it's kind of where I was brought up in the whole concept of edge lands and, and, and uh, a landscape that is on the edge of usually a town or a city. Um, and because I was brought up, you know, on the edge of the Cleveland Hills on the way up to the Yorkshire Moors on a very big housing estate which suddenly stopped halfway up the hill and then it became as close as you're going to get in that part of England to, to wilderness, really. And you talk about the edge lands in terms of Cambridgeshire and South Cambridge, which is also a place that I lived for a while. So I kind of understand that. But it's a, it's a, it's a landscape that a lot, a lot of people wouldn't really um, set much store by, isn't it? And, and actually may go out for the odd... Hinching Book Country Park is a case in point, isn't it? And may go out for a little wander around, but don't really see what's, what's going on around them. How important do you think it is, particularly in this period where, you know, we're trying to find new housing for people, and, you know, the, uh, during this campaign, various parties are all saying they will build more houses. You know, it's a real issue at the moment, isn't it, this whole edgelands idea? Yeah, so you'll probably be familiar with the term and uh, you'll certainly be familiar with the environment. Uh, it, ha it goes by many names, so Victor Hugo calls it terrain vague um, uh, or uh, bastard countryside. Uh, Philip Guston, the artist, used to go out and cruise it with Philip Roth, the novelist, and called it Crapola, this sort of fraying out city where the city runs into the the country such as these, we can hold to these categories and indeed the very notion of edgelands confuses them. And Marion Shoard, the great environmentalist and land rights campaigner, I think m most influentially coined the term 
edge lands and they're all around us and we all move through them we find them quite hard to see because they're transit zones uh, unless we live in them and so there's a chapter about Richard Jeffries the 19th century nature writer and I think we can confidently call him a nature writer though he was also a political journalist for a while and he lived in Surbiton which in the time he moved to it was the edge of the maximum city of the world which was London the Babylon of the globe that was expanding uh, astonishingly fast in that period and so the edgelands were very dynamic and mobile places and Jeffries walked out into them he suffered from a, a kind of magnetic compulsion repulsion fixation with London and he was both drawn to its might and its dust and its power and also pushed out and he would follow paths and streams out from Surbiton he'd be hard pressed to do that now into the fields and recorded an astonishing profusion of farmland wildlife which again in many ways you would be hard pushed to do now and uh, reading his diaries from the 1870s and 1880s you encounter uh, a, ri a richness of life right where the city meets the country uh, something we, we could call an ecotone, a sort of transitional zone that actually provides a lot of niches for ruderal species, weeds, uh, opportunist um, animals and, um, and but it's very hard to see and it took me 10 years of living in a South Cambridge edgeland to come to any kind of terms with it. I didn't like seeing pants hanging off the hawthorn hedges by the beech woods where the doggers went um, <laughs> uh, and I didn't like fly tipping and I still don't particularly like these things but I see that the park and ride and the golf course and they're, they're, they're points where a n very modern kind of nature is happening and where the peregrines hunt and they make their nests in abandoned chalk pits which were still being dug until the 1950s and out of which Cambridge was built. So, I mean, you must have seen this and, 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 and documented it the whole, the whole time. Well, the, the, the arguments over the green belt and brownfield sites and all of those things were the staple fare of, and still are the staple fare of, of country fire. And I think it kind of simplifies the issue far too much to say where those, those phrases themselves just simplify the issue far too much. You know, countryside to one individual can be something very different to somebody else who's, you know, lived out in a wilderness for a long time. And, um, yeah, I mean, being brought up and living in those areas, you start to see the beauty of them after a while. You know, even was with the pants hanging the off the bush. Was there a fence at the back that, that fenced off your estate from the moor? No, or did there it wasn't. Just, no, it just no, it was, out. It, it, was, it was interesting in that respect. The estate just stopped, the hill started. As soon as you reached the top of the hills, that was the Yorkshire moors all the way across to, to the Yorkshire coast. And, um, you know, at the time, you, as a child, you kind of take it for granted. But at the same time as taking it for granted, you'll go up there and spend weekends there and go camping. And, and you know, there was some feeling... That of liberation in just getting away from that dormitory town in the space of just 20, 25 minutes on foot that I've just never experienced since. And I think, you know, it's, it's interesting for people who live on the edge of towns to be able to do that. And I think there is a sense of liberation that people don't feel comfortable necessarily expressing because it isn't, it isn't classic countryside, is it? It's kind of the scrublands at the edge until you've walked for a half an hour or, or so and then it becomes something else. And I did a program, Ramblings with Claire Balding, which uh, a good number of you will have listened to one way or another. Uh, and I took her for a walk from my front door out through past the pants and the fly tipping. And the, and I felt this need to keep apologising. I said, you know, exactly, I'm sorry, yeah. I know yeah. you'd much rather be on the North York yeah. Moors or da da da. And then, um, and then I climbed a tree and she did some uh, Olympic style commentary on my ascent. And uh, <laughs> I think we both felt, you know, like a ritual had been enacted at that point and we could actually find this because we were walking along a, a, f a field path that is about 50 years old and is about to be swallowed by a housing estate that I in the end supported the planning application for uh, which is the field path you heard me writing about in uh, reading from in the Peregrine chapter which leads to a Roman road which leads to a Neolithic trackway the Icknield way and so you pass 50 years, um, 2,000 years, 5,000 years by ha taking a right and then a left and then a right, more or less. Um, and but that's all overlaid by this by this amazing layering of, um, of, of 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 all the things we've been we've been talking about. So that landscape has a language too, 
and it's a very modern and dynamic language, in fact, um, and a fascinating one. Yeah, we were talking a little bit earlier about children and making up language. Um, I think for your final reading, you'll be. Yeah, I'll just read a couple of final chapter. couple of paragraphs in praise of children, really, um, and and the language that they have. Uh, and this um, is from the chapter that I've told you a little about. So. The profusion of doorways that the children discovered in Hinchingbrook. They, everything was a doorway, a ho hole in a tree, uh, a smews, um, uh, a, a finger hole poked in the muddy ground. These were all portals to them because they led to infinite worlds. And the move that they made into the meadows and out of the trees, so they explored out into the open spaces with some trepidation, finding the, tr finding the forest actually oddly secure allowed the, their travelling to reach a new fantastic level. And this in turn helped Deb, who I was working with, to comprehend the children's experiences. She realised they were undertaking a kind of fabulous motion in which worlds slipped easily around each other, where there were soft boundaries between what is real and what is remembered, and each place in front of them was somewhere else too. Childhood is a branch of cartography, suggests Michael Chabon, but surely we should reverse the terms of his proposition. Cartography is a branch of childhood. Children are intense and intuitive mappers, using story, touch and paper to plot their places. Deb and Caroline watched in the afternoons as the children drew maps of the park that were also documents of realms beyond sight, for in their Hinchingbrook Country Park, wolves lived in tunnels deep within a mountain, dolphins sang below the surface of the lake, there were tree houses and air cities, and the sky held cold suns and hot moons. In the final weeks, Caroline drew a huge outline of the park in chalk on brown paper. This was taped to the wall in the corridor and became a canvas on which the children could place their individual maps like tiles in a mosaic. And in this way, a collaged atlas of the park came into existence. A map of maps, as Caroline called it, a map of the mind's adventures. And that's where I'll stop. But thank you very much. For this. I, I think it's time now. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. I think it's time now to, to open to questions from the floor. Okay, so it's, it's your chance to ask questions. If you want to um, do so, could you just raise your hand and I'll make sure everybody has a chance to ask a question. And if you could say who you are too, please. Hello. Hi. Um, just to say thank you very much for another fantastic book. Really enjoyed reading it. And just something if you could tell us a little bit more about Underlands, which I think is your next project you're working on. I, yes, I, I'm, I'm writing a long, slow book about underworlds uh, of many kinds, mythic, metaphoric, actual, um, industrial. And um, it's taking me to some very strange places. I have absolutely no idea where I, where the wormholes and the tunnels will lead and what realms they will join up. And it will probably take me a decade, I think, in total terms from start to finish. Um, uh, but so far, I've ended up in the Parisian catacombs and an underground river in Slovenia and a, a glacier-filled ice cave in uh, northern Italy and, uh, and the Mendips. Uh, so burial cultures, entombments, caves, cataphilia, the Baroque. Lots of limestone. <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun. So uh, about darkness and, and the strange visions it brings us. Hello, my name is Nick Compton. Um, my wife is currently reading um, The Old Ways. And I think there's, there's a passage in which you um, climb up a, a, um, a field and, and um, lie down and, and enjoy the sun. And she pointed out to me that um, as a woman, she wouldn't be able to do that. Um, because she, she would feel too threatened and, um, <coughs> and vulnerable. And um, I wondered whether, whether you'd thought about uh, whether, whether there's a, a difference in the relationship, fundamental relationship between um, men and women and the landscape and nature. Yeah, it's a very good question and, and one I'm, I'm familiar with. I'm always, I'm fully reluctant to establish any kind of fundamental difference between the ways uh, men and women experience the landscape, but clearly there are cultural conditions uh, that need uh, taking into account. Uh, it's always a pleasure to me to, to, to discover that by far the majority of my readers are women, um, and, uh, 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 and it is also not exclusively the case that 
uh, all of them feel that they're unable to carry out the kinds of um, being in the landscape that I might be able to, though some of them do feel that. Uh, and one of the writers I've had most to do with is Nan, Nan Shepherd. Um, am I on? Yes, I'm on, yeah. I, is Nan Shepherd, who actually refuses at, at, to gender her experience of the Cairngorms, though it's very easy to say that she was a, a writer for whom the summit was a, a form of masculine folly uh, and for whom uh, pilgrimage and exploration were more feminine ways of uh, encountering the landscape. In fact, she, she doesn't gender it in those terms, though, though, though people have. Um, Rebecca Solnit writes a really fantastic pair of chapters in her book on the history of walking wanderlust about how walking is uh, a perilous and stigmatized in the city context activity for women or has been for a long time. If you walk, you're prey or you're uh, a street walker. And that's, again, not exclusively the case, but we see many um, contemporary outworkings of, of attempts to reclaim the possibility for, for walking. But um, uh, I know a lot of women who go and lie down in fields and love the feel of the sun on their face and I wish in a way that our culture was such that anyone could do that and, and not feel threatened, but it, it isn't. It is something I think about a lot. Um, thanks very much. Um, you're doing very well considering your <laughs> sleep. I wanted just to ask a bit more about the use of the metaphor in, uh, in, in your work. Um, because you know, you obviously explain it that this is an empathy that comes through the metaphor and explains it and teases, analyzes the natural phenomenon. Um, I'm just wondering if it can get rather than the weight or of understanding what nature is in and of itself. Um, so is it rather inhibits our under our true understanding of nature, as it were. So if I just take some notions, or just say Uxkul and you know, the animal in its own environment, in its own Umwelt, and, uh, and understanding that, it's not possible through the use of the metaphor, though, I, would, I would argue, would it? Um, in a way, uh, um, having described you as a nature writer, are you more a landscape writer? I mean, I think you're, more, you're a landscape writer rather than a nature writer because you, you really just to really use the landscape to reflect human experience, is that would it be correct? Uh, well, there are lots of parts to that question. I, I probably won't um, respond to all of them. Uh, I, I do decline uh, the, the, the label nature writer now, partly because I think it's become sort of fully franchised and in problematic ways, but uh, also because I actually don't know that much about nature, but I think very hard about landscape without any full and total answers ever given uh, on that subject, I think. Um, personally, I, I, I don't understand what it would mean to represent the essence of nature. <laughs> um, language is always figurative. It is a figurative system. Uh, light is ungrammatical. Uh, so I f uh, find that at times, metaphor can become this fabulously precise form of seeing. And at other times, and Nan Shepherd is a good example of this, very simple denotative sentences can achieve precisely the kind of lucid illumination that a multi-clause metaphor can. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, a, a variety of styles is, is there, but, but language is, is always in the way, but also on the way. And uh, that I that it's that on the way that it excites me about it, while acknowledging the former. I know these are. I mean, these are huge philosophical questions. I know uh, subject-object relations, and um, how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yes. Hi, my name's Colette, um, and I do feel okay about lying in a field in the sun. <laughs> um, although I, d I do take Nick's point that there is, I wouldn't say go out walking in the landscape at night, which is perhaps something men would feel more comfortable doing. But my question was more about the writing process. I've been trying to do some writing about walking recently, and what I've found really useful is to take a little mini recorder, and then I can speak as I walk about what I'm seeing. And I'm just really fascinated to know whether 
that's something you do, if, whether you've just got such a good memory for all the details that they come back to you without needing an immediate recording device there. Um, well, <coughs> some of the audience we, we've spent, we've been talking about this and comparing notes on on taking notes um, through the day. And uh, I remember my mum brought me a dictaphone and said, "Come on, you know, here's something you can take." And I said, "Mum, I'm not walking through the landscape with a fucking dictaphone in my hand." You know, T. S. Eliot talks about the blue pencil behind the ear as a poet. He could never get the blue pencil of the editor out from behind his ear, and it can feel like that—that that you're editing as you walk rather than as some sort of notional primary experience. But the answer is, I carry a notebook and I jot down fragments and shards uh, and, and notes as they come, uh, but try to keep it not sort of between me and, and there, as it were. Uh, and then at home comes a, I pour all those fragments out onto a page or a screen and then begin a very, very long kind of mosaic process of tessellating and adding and and shifting and shifting and shifting until a picture comes into to view um, but uh, I have a poor memory for text but a fairly strong visual memory for and walking helps doesn't it it's a memorial activity or a memorious activity um, in many many ways I, I find it easy to remember bits of walks and I don't know if that's true for you but um. This book of yours in particular seems to, to rest with words and discussions of landscapes, and yet landscapes obviously are very visual as well as visceral. And I was wondering whether obviously you have to have a map at some points in your life. And so looking at the visual of the map and what that means to you and the absences and particulars and specifics within it and when you love them and when you hate them. Uh, well, um, thank you for a really fascinating question and one that I've never been asked before, which is not to say I've been asked the other questions before, though uh, some of them I've met versions of. But um, I never use a GPS, and I've, I've uh, sort of, except once I did use one in a difficult situation, but, and I've, one, I never carry one, somebody had one, but I've wondered why I'm so resistant to this idea of being, having the availability of a, of a, of a state launched satellite to locate myself in the world and I guess I've answered my own question but <laughs> but you know the mapping was done with them uh, well you know was done through military initiatives in the ordnance early ordnance survey and subsequently by satellite mapping and so that's just a transcribed version of uh, of this form of vision so uh, but I but like so many people I love maps and uh, one of the most amazing gifts I've ever been given was Nan Shepard's map which her executor gave me of the of the northern cairngorms and uh something about the folds and the, the 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 materiality of it is absolutely thrilling and i love one to 25s and i love one to 50s and i think the ordnance survey mapping of this country is rivaled only by the topo of switzerland which is a different kind of art form um but uh, so i absolutely relish them uh but of course they they are partial and static uh, at least in their paper form and so they, they entice, but with their uh, uh, reticence and their limit. Um, so, yeah, fascinated, fascinated by them and can't quite work out my, my resistance to, to GPS. Thank you. Um, my question relates to um, landscape and voice. And I frame it in with telling you two tales from my own childhood. I can have a distinct uh, memory of being in an open landscape and screaming at the top of my voice and listening back to the echo of this scape, uh, landscape and feeling very enlarged and amplified being within the space. But equally so, I, I can remember uh, going out on a stormy night in, in the countryside, strong wind and screaming at the top of my voice and not being able to hear myself because of the, the rush of the wind. And then feeling very in in anonymous, uh, invisible, um, kind of diminished, and m my question to you is whether you have had any, have any reflections or thoughts about how our voices respond to, or how we articulate ourselves through voice within landscape. Uh, this is a fascinating question, and uh, um, it it reminds me that the two 
lines that are most often quoted from Mountains of the Mind, they're not very often quoted, but one of them is uh, the, the line that I wish I'd never ever written, which is where I'm traversing a snow slope and have about 2,000 foot drop uh, below me back when I did such things. Um, I was roped up, but I, I wrote, I looked between my legs and saw a whole lot of nothing. Um, <laughs> how did that get into the published book? Um, and I actually did do an event at Tavistock Square, um, uh, home of uh, psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, and um, that was where it was pointed out to me by my interviewer, very early, in fact, in that, um, before he launched his mountain as mother breast thesis, uh, there, there, there came the climber as emasculated male thesis, and, you know, they both have aspects of truth to them, clearly, but um, anyway, the other line that gets quoted is... Um, uh, uh, which I don't even re particularly remember writing, but I guess I must have done, is those who travel to mountaintops are half in love with themselves and half in love with oblivion. And it is that familiarity with uh, the, the uh, amplified ego in that sense, and then this sense of utter insignificance in the face of deep time and vast space. But I think your question relates to voice very particularly and to speaking and shouting and crying. Um, and that, that is starting to interest me underground a great deal because underground spaces are effectively large chambers of resonance and amplifying chambers and sound travels very, very peculiarly in them. So I've started making sound recordings uh, within them and started, I was indeed working with a, with a musician uh, on that, but he, he died very young and very suddenly and in fact was buried with a copy of The Peregrine, which was the only book he ever read and reread and reread and reread. So, uh, so that, that collaboration came to an end, but I, it, I have a whole kind of set of sound files and interests in terms of underground resonance, so I perhaps will have a better answer for you in about seven years. <laughs> I wonder if I could use the privilege to ask you one question myself, and I'm not quite sure I know how to ask it. The starting point is I was brought up on the west coast of Scotland and I spent quite a bit of time on the Ardnamurchan Peninsula, which is quite a rugged peninsula where the, uh, the, the Gulf Stream comes down. And I believe, from my experience, that we all carry landscapes within ourselves. And I have a very strong sense of identity from this particular place. I could not find the words to describe it, though. And the question, I think, is about the descriptive nature of language. The f if a painter could describe something in words, they would not make the painting. You paint it because there are no words. And the fascinating thing about the words you use is because they're unfamiliar, they're not descriptive in the common jargon. Therefore, they have this power to unlock emotions and feelings inside people. But they will become descriptive and they will be assimilated at some point. So there's a kind of boundary between things that are unfamiliar but very evocative. And then they become common jargon and they lose their power. And I just wondered if there's any, um, I don't know if I'm making it clear, but if there's anything in that about the use well of language. It's a, it's a fascinating question and, and, and very clear. And actually the book is, I suppose in academic terms or linguistic terms, we would call this power of language uh, performative or illocutionary, the power that yeah. language has to act uh, very energetically upon, upon its users yeah. and its audience. And, and there are a couple of stories in the book, uh, folktale from the finish, which is all about language's ability to perform yeah. tasks and yeah. ch change and shape utterance and thought. Yeah. So I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, it, it hadn't occurred to me that by re-releasing them, a, a decay would, you know, a half-life would begin yeah. and that they would lose that potency. Um, in some sense, I think that's fine because they were, if they are radioactive, they were buried deep, deep down, um, mm. and 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 now they will they will release their charge back out again. I'm thinking of this as a positive radioactivity, just to maintain <laughs> the, uh, the the energy metaphor. But um, uh, and so, but yes, I sort of I, th I think they're strange enough that they will they will do their they will do valuable work before mm. before they fade away again. Yeah, but the other part of that is if you take folk song. There is no original melody. There's only a long tradition of linkages where one thing becomes another thing and progresses. So it always stays slightly unfamiliar. And I presume the language you use, if it became common language, would go on to grow and to change in common usage. Well, I hope so. I hope yeah. so. And I, uh, some, of the, some of the mail I get is not, uh, are not words that are being given, but wishes for words. Yeah. So people wanting, they say, 
do you have a word for the fox paths that crisscross suburban gardens? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I say no, yeah. but uh, I'll throw it out there and see, yeah. see what happens. So, yeah. 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 So are there any more questions? Alan? Yeah, C can I ask a question via Andrew or ask Andrew to, to respond in some respects to, to Robert's work? Uh, as a broadcaster, what do you think is, is most televisual about Robert's writing or works? And what is most conducive to, say, sound broadcasting? Well, to, uh, I'll start with the end of that. Uh, d to sound broadcasting, it sounds like what you're doing at the moment um, uh, for your next book is hugely conducive to sound. Um, and you're already making recordings, as you said. So I would guess that, that you know, uh, I'm no commissioner of, of radio, but I guess there's an entire series in that one, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, <I'll do> <laughs> here you go. <laughs> to, to me, I mean, visually, I think um, it's clear, because you've already worked with, for example, BBC4, that there's a, there's a, a real market there for um, thoughtful, considered um, television that 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 allows time for people to think, and I think maybe if there is a, and I'm sure there are plenty of criticisms of Country File, but if there is one, it's the pace of the of the program. It doesn't give you time to stop and think quite often. I think, you know, on the whole, um, BBC Four allows you to do that, and I think um, the work, the for example, Nan Shepherd and the Cairngorms and revisiting that area, which is what. BBC Four did essentially, isn't it? Is is perfect television for that audience, and I think that translates brilliantly into television. So I think you know there, there's a lot in your work that that would do the same. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. What would you commission? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would have commissioned Mountains of the Mind, but somebody already did. <laughs> okay. Well, can I say that I took I took on board your as a fellow academic your point about rigor. Um, one of the things I do think, actually, that I get from your work is that what I get out of it is precision and concision, an economy of language that's very precise and very sharp, which is very, very hard to do. It looks simple, but it's actually very hard to do. So can I thank, on behalf of everybody here, can I just thank Robert and Andrew for a really fascinating evening which of deep thought, which has very, been very well um, explained to us. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>